Hello everybody. First of all, I would like uh, to thank the organizer of the Cosmology Forum Home for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Marta Spinelli. I'm a postdoc at ETH in Zurich. And today I'm going to discuss uh, the subject of research of 21 centimeter intensity mapping. And in particular, what are the opportunities and the challenges uh, now that the SKA Observatory is, uh, uh, is going to be built and, uh, and taking data in the near future. The main ingredient of, of this uh, field of research, and so we're going to discuss what this 21 centimeter means, uh, is uh, uh, hydrogen. In particular, uh, how uh, hydrogen played a key role in all the evolution of the universe, from recombination, uh, when the CMB has been released, so when neutral hydrogen formed, through all the phases where hydrogen was neutral, uh, and then the cosmic dome, when the first start, stars started to shine and all through the epoch of ionization when it got rayonized again and the key role especially neutral legend played in uh, the in the late universe uh, in galaxy evolution so uh, the the key probe that we're going to use uh, to do this is uh, its 21 centimeter line uh, and in particular i'm going to show you in a second how uh, really uh, tracking the 21 centimeter line of neutral legend is possible to span a huge arch uh, of the evolution of the universe uh, from the late universe down really to the cosmic dome. And uh, uh, in particular, uh, the other main point of this talk is how we can do that, so we can do 21 centimeter cosmology with the SKA observatory. So why 21 centimeter cosmology? Well, uh, because the signal uh, from the 21 centimeter line is redshifted due to the expansion of the universe. And this, uh, uh, due to, to this expansion, uh, the, the frequency uh, uh, that uh, corresponds to the 21 centimeter line, that is uh, 1,420 megahertz, get redshifted to radio frequencies. So uh, if we have a radio telescope, we can, uh, in principle, really go back uh, down to the, to the cosmic dome. Um, and indeed, this is what the SKA Observatory is going to do because it's going to cover all the relevant frequency and also it's going to cover this with really unprecedented sensitivity. So the SKA Observatory is going to be composed of two main observatories, uh, one uh, the SKA Low in, uh, in, in Australia that will cover really uh, the, the very uh, low frequency down to 50 megahertz uh, and this will cover uh, all the epoch of ionization down to the cosmic dome uh, even the redshift 30. Um, and then the other, the other observatory that is part of the SKE uh, is going to be the, the SKE mid uh, that is going to cover uh, mid frequencies and uh, we can use it to, to study uh, the, the post ionization universe, so what happened during the last structure formation uh, and uh, this uh, telescope, the SKE mid, is going to be in, uh, in, uh, in the Karoo Desert in, uh, in South Africa. And uh, part of the thing that I'm going to discuss in this talk uh, are things that we have already done with data, uh, because part of the SKA MID is already built. Uh, this is the Mirkat telescope that is going to be part of the uh, larger uh, uh, telescope array that is going to be the, the SKA MID. But 64 antennas of Mirkat are already there, are already taking data, and they span a very interesting range of frequencies. And so for us, a redshift uh, up to where we can uh, arrive uh, with the UHF band uh, up to redshift 1.5, that is very interesting uh, for, uh, for cosmological purposes. So why it's so interesting uh, neutral hydrogen and what are we going to learn mapping this presence of neutral hydrogen through the 21 centimeter line across the universe? Uh, well, first of all, since uh, uh, we are mapping something that is baryonic, uh, and, but what we are interested in is the cosmology, we have to take care in, of the relation between the dark universe and, and the baryons in our case, in particular uh, neutral hydrogen. So there is uh, a, a core part of questions that we want to uh, answer that belongs to the dark universe that uh, uh, is really the fundamental question of uh, that cosmology has opened so as you know what we don't know what is the nature of dark matter and dark energy and so uh, what we, we can trace with the, uh, the, the tracing the, the presence of neutral hydrogen is uh, how dark matter is distributed on large scales uh, and how uh, does this distribution evolve with cosmic time because, because we can really span uh, a huge range of redshift uh, and then uh, in this uh, evolution and how this evolution uh, changes so what is the role of dark energies on this uh, 
Uh, but as we were saying, we are not directly seeing the dark universe because what we are tracing is actually uh, this bias tracer that is neutral hydrogen. So at the other side is uh, how the, the baryons trace this dark matter. So what is the link between the galaxies and the dark matter halos and how these H1 galaxies uh, that contains uh, uh, most of the H1 are distributed in the cosmic web. Um, and then uh, another open question that seems a, a very simple one, but we still don't know, is how the total cosmic H1 quant uh, density evolved uh, with the redshift, because we have measured uh, at a very low redshift, but not uh, as a function of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of redshift, so at uh, uh, like earliest stages of the evolution of the universe. So uh, to do this, what we want to do is uh, uh, intensity mapping. So why uh, intensity mapping? What is intensity mapping? So uh, up to now, it's clear that what we want to trace is this distribution of the neutral hydrogen, because neutral hydrogen is, a, a, even if it's biased, is a tracer of the matter clustering. And so this is very similar uh, to what is done with galaxy surveys. So when normally in, in, in galaxy survey, you're going to uh, resolve single galaxies and study how these galaxies are distributed um, across uh, redshift and space. Um, and as you know, in cosmology, what we are mostly interested in is uh, the large scales. The, the large scales. Of course, we are also interested a lot in the small scales, uh, but for some of the, uh, the, 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 for example, the constraint of cosmological parameter, these are the most interesting one. So uh, what is the idea of the intensity mapping? Uh, it's to answer the question how we can efficiently observe cosmological volumes because one of the, the limitations that we have for H1 is that resolving H1 galaxies at uh, uh, redshift that are not the super local is, uh, is very difficult, it's very time consuming, so we cannot do that. So the, the, what intensity mapping proposes is instead of solving or resolving the single H1 galaxies to actually have uh, uh, take a map um, of, uh, of, the, of the sky at uh, different frequencies, uh, collecting the total intensity of 20, the 21 centimeter line. So in this large pix pixel in the sky with low spatial resolution, where we are just collecting all the information without need of resolving uh, any of the structure that is inside these large pixels. But since and what, uh, this is like results in a map that is quite similar uh, to, the, to a CMB map. So uh, we're going to see that some of the technique that we use in intensity mapping are quite similar to the one that has been developed for the CMB. But what is interesting for us is that uh, we are mapping something that evolved with redshift. And so scanning different frequency, we can actually see different redshift. So we can really have uh, a, a tomographic uh, view of the universe, a, a high spectral resolution tomographic view of the universe. So these, of course, especially if you want to see the evolution of dark matter and dark energy, uh, uh, really prove, prove how much uh, 21 centimeter intensity mapping can be a key cosmological probe. So uh, now let's imagine that uh, uh, everything is easy and then we can do this full sky map of how uh, the 21 centimeter uh, line, so the, the, the presence of neutral hydrogen is distributed across us at different, uh, around us at different redshift. So if we can do that, uh, we can do a lot of, uh, of things useful for cosmology because we can measure the, the H1 power spectrum at different redshift uh, and uh, we can uh, measure the BAO in a way that is uh, uh, quite uh, compatible uh, with, for example, uh, what the, uh, a survey like Euclid would do. And this you can see in this uh, central plot, uh, SK is the pink intensity mapping, uh, an intensity mapping survey with SK is the uh, pink line and uh, Euclid is in, is in black. So this is taken from the SK Red Book, uh, where a lot of uh, cosmological uh, uh, survey that can be done with, uh, with SK have been covered. Uh, today I'm going to discuss uh, 21 centimeter intensity mapping, but there's plenty of things uh, we can do with the SK. So if you're interested, please uh, just have a look uh, at, the, at the SK Red Book. So uh, as we were saying, so we can measure the 21 centimeter intensity mapping, the H1 in, uh, so, sorry, the, the, with intensity mapping, we can measure the, the 21 centimeter power spectrum, we can measure the BAO, uh, we can measure the cosmological parameter and for example, combine this with Planck. And uh, uh, since uh, uh, similarly to what happened for the uh, last case structure, there are degeneracies in, uh, uh, in different direction uh, for the CMB and the 21 centimeter intensity mapping. So we can actually uh, break some degeneracies and improve uh, plant constraint on cosmological parameter. 
how, uh, for example, we can construct some of this forecast and how this 21 centimeter power spectrum looks like. Uh, so here uh, you can see that uh, is uh, uh, proportional, of course, to the matter power spectrum. This is what uh, we are uh, behind in the dark universe that we want to measure. But there are some terms in front. So of course, one you, you recognize uh, the Kaiser uh, term with F. Uh, the growth structure and mu the, the cosine of the angle between k and the line of sight. Uh, in front of this, you can see also that there is uh, uh, the bias, uh, and in this case, it's not the gal galaxy bias, but it's the bias of the H1. And uh, with respect to what we normally see in galaxy survey, there is a, a term more, is this temperature brightness. So because indeed, we are not uh, directly measuring the uh, the H1 content, but we are measuring it through uh, the uh, temperature brightness of the 21 centimeter line. So we need this term uh, that uh, uh, is actually proportional um, to, uh, for example, uh, the uh, total uh, H1 density as a function of, of, of redshift. So exactly as for uh, Lasky structure survey, uh, we can uh, compute from this power spectrum using uh, the uh, Legend polynomial, uh, the, um, the power spectrum multiples. And uh, for our forecast, uh, for example, in this paper with Maria Berti, that is a, a PhD student at CISA, uh, we have considered uh, only the monopole and the quadrupole because we are assuming that uh, uh, higher multiple are going to be very noisy. And we have set up uh, a very uh, SK mid like conservation type. So we have six redshift pin between zero and three. That is the maximum redshift that we can reach with the SK mid. And we are assuming a, um, a technique of um, for uh, uh, 21 centimeter uh, intensity mapping with the SK that is called single dish. I'm going to go back uh, to this later. Uh, but uh, so what you have to consider is that we are using this SK mid dish as a collection of dishes and the fact that uh, they have a limit side create a beam effect so there are scales that we are not able to resolve because of this dumping of the beam so we take this into account with the specific of the dishes that uh, the scheme is going to be built with and of course we also have to add how what is the expected level of noise and what is the expected sky area that we think we can measure with the SK. So these are the, the resulting uh, P0 and P2, uh, and this uh, strange shape is indeed uh, uh, due uh, to, the, to the beam suppression, and different colors are with different redshift beam. So if we assume you can do this type of, uh, of measurement with the SKA, um, we can constrain uh, the cosmological parameter, uh, we can do it, uh, uh, we can have a good constraining power uh, around 10%. And uh, uh, this is interesting, it's not competitive directly with Planck, but is uh, uh, interesting how this is a completely different probe. So we are probing uh, a completely different bias. So uh, having a consistent measure of H0, for example, for Lask from Lasky structure CMB and uh, this type of uh, Lasky structure survey, so 21 centimeter intensity mapping would be very interesting. Let me also show this nice result that we got uh, that, uh, in this paper led by Maria, uh, where if we combine uh, the, our SKA uh, forecasted measurement with Planck, uh, we get a, a percent improvement over Planck that is up to a factor two. So this is quite interesting. You can see the difference between uh, the blue uh, um, posterior and the posterior we obtain, uh, the green posterior we obtain uh, for, uh, for the SKA. Um, since there is inside uh, our measurement also the temperature brightness as some uh, parameter that uh, uh, we don't really know how to evolve with redshift, uh, a more um, realistic uh, constraint is actually the orange one, uh, but in principle it's always possible to do uh, separate surveys, uh, not necessarily 21 centimeter intensity mapping one with the SKA, learn for example what is the variation of the omega H1 as a functional redshift and really fix this what we call nuisance parameter. So have an idea of for example of this temperature brightness as a function of redshift evolve. So what is uh, so all this is very good. Uh, we know that we can do very nice constraint. It's a, a completely different probe, but there is a huge challenge. And the huge challenge is that uh, what we are seeing when we look at the sky is not the nice map uh, of the H1 distribution I was showing you before, but is uh, uh, this uh, map 
<laughs> this uh, uh, huge uh, galaxy in uh, synchrotron emission in radio frequency, which is uh, our galaxy in front of us. So we can always say, okay, then uh, we can maybe try to avoid uh, the main uh, emission from the galaxy and restrict it to a part uh, of the sky where the galaxy is less uh, intense, but still there's not only synchrotron emission from our galaxies, uh, we're gonna see it in more detail later, uh, but there are uh, other stuff, there's uh, extragalactic uh, foregrounds also uh, that are playing a, a role uh, in how then we have to get to the 21 centimeter and uh, emission. But it's also more complicated than this because there's not only uh, the sky, there's also the fact that we are trying to take a measurement from Earth. And uh, even if we are uh, with the SKA, for example, in the Karoo Desert, far from everything, there's a lot of RFI uh, coming from, from what human uh, product. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, RFI from from the cities around, even if they are far away. There's RFI from the fact that satellites pass in the sky. So this complicates a lot uh, the, the the disentanglement between the 21 centimeter signal and all this foreground because everything gets a bit convolved together. Uh, and then it's not finished because not, it's not only what is around the telescope, it's the telescope itself that is complicated. For example, the shape uh, of the foreground, as we're going to see also uh, later. So uh, there are uh, really complications uh, that uh, it's not only the, the problem of uh, this huge foreground in front of us, is how this huge foreground in front of us interact with the RFI, with the telescope, and also the fact that when we are trying to take measurement of the sky, in a certain way, we're going to have, for example, non-homogeneous noise uh, due to the to the scanning strategy where we are looking at the sky. So there is uh, a lot of complication that we take that we need to take into account. And uh, uh, the, this talk is all about what we are trying to do as a pipeline, uh, how we are trying to deal with some of these uh, uh, effects. So uh, let me first uh, discuss a bit the foreground again, what are these type of foregrounds, which property do they have. So from uh, this plot that you're seeing now, you can see that uh, uh, with respect to the H1 signal that is in black, they are order of magnitude larger. Uh, there are extra galactic free, free and galactic free, free and especially synchrotron, especially uh, the galactic synchrotron on the large scales and also point sources that uh, whose contribution uh, depends on how much we think we can uh, take out point sources from, from our map. Uh, and so this is why there are different uh, lines and different uh, values. So if we assume that we can remove the brightest point sources, we can go a bit uh, lower with the, uh, the power of, uh, of this um, contaminants. Um, so this is the fact that they are much stronger than our signal that is in black uh, with respect to the other, uh, but they also have another property that is quite interesting and that will be quite fundamental for our purposes, is the fact that if we take uh, a line of sight and we look at this line of sight as a function of frequency, so as a function of uh, for 21 centimeter as a function of redshift, but for the foreground as a function of frequency, what we're going to see is that the 21 centimeter line uh, has an almost noise-like behavior it oscillates a lot as a function of frequency, uh, while the foreground are really, really smooth because they are quite correlated in frequency because it's always the same galaxies, uh, for example, galactic synchrotron that we are seeing at different frequency. So uh, there are these two fundamental properties of the foreground. One is that they are much stronger, and the other one is that they are very smooth because they are highly correlated in frequency. So the question that we want to ask is uh, how uh, these properties of the foreground can be used to separate uh, the pristine 21 centimeter signal uh, from them. And, uh, and in the way we, as we were discussing just, just in the previous slide, uh, but what if uh, uh, we add also some realism in our simulation? So we take into account all uh, the, the, the process of, uh, of taking data. So the fact that there's only foreground, but there is the beam response, there's the noise, there's the, uh, the radio frequency interference, as we were discussing just now. Uh, so uh, how uh, the community uh, at large, the 21 centimeter community at large, uh, deals with that. So there are various strategies that uh, uh, I am going to just briefly name uh, with some examples. So uh, for example, uh, a 21 centimeter uh, signal at high redshift, uh, uh, one approach, uh, even if it's a slightly different type of uh, observation, is through modeling. So we try to model the foregrounds, then we do a Bayesian uh, 
inference on this parameter that uh, described the modeling and we try to extract simultaneously the foreground and the signal. Another very popular st strategy, uh, especially for the EOR, is uh, uh, called avoidance. So it's uh, uh, we know, uh, since of these properties of the foreground, more or less where we expect this foreground to be in this uh, uh, k-parallel, k-perpendicular uh, plane, and we expect that there is a certain UR window where there's no foreground. So we can avoid uh, the, the part where we think there's foreground and just concentrate, cut out this part and concentrate the analysis on these clean UR windows, in principle clean UR window. Uh, the third uh, separation uh, cleaning technique that I'm going to mention uh, is what I'm going to present to you in a second, uh, and it's the fact that we can really try to separate uh, uh, or clean, as we always say in this field, uh, the foreground. Uh, these are techniques that are kind of uh, taken from uh, uh, originally from the CMB, but also some of them are applied also in 21 centimeter cosmology for EOR, uh, hypocoprionization redshift. So here I list uh, a bit of uh, strange names. So there's a, a principal component analysis, the classical one that I'm going to present, but also uh, 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 KPCA, fast ICA, GMCA, uh, GPR, machine learning enhanced GPR. So you can find uh, a lot of techniques. There's a, um, you can uh, ask for reference if you want, but uh, it's a really uh, booming uh, uh, subject, uh, the cleaning of the foreground, because it's going to be the, the biggest thing to do before we can really do cosmology with the 21 centimeter signal. So uh, just uh, uh, to give you an idea of how this works, uh, what is this, uh, uh, for example, an example for the PCA. So let's imagine we have a mock observation cube uh, that uh, uh, it's highlighted in here, um, a very uh, uh, meerkat, uh, as we're going to see in a second, like type of observation cube. We have a patch uh, in the sky that we have observed at different frequencies, uh, so uh, around a certain redshift, for example, redshift 0.5. So we have uh, 100 uh, channels, so meaning 100 frequency around this, uh, this redshift. Uh, we put uh, uh, simulated foreground in it, so we put the synchrotron, as you can see here, this smoothed, uh, smooth uh, um, uh, image that you see, but also free free point sources, we put a very simple Gaussian beam and white noise. And then we say, okay, so this uh, observational cube T that I'm measuring, uh, I'm assuming is the sum of various components. Uh, a part uh, that is a mixing matrix, matrix uh, 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 mo that multiplies foreground sources plus the noise plus the cosmological signal I'm interested in. So there's also the cosmological signal uh, inside here. So uh, one of one uh, um, term that you're gonna see often in uh, uh, in uh, this type of of, of subjects, so in, uh, in general foreground cleaning, is so how many sources should we uh, should we consider? How many uh, sources are there that we need to parameterize? And so the the parameter that we it's often used is called uh, n foreground, and is uh, uh, a parameter that uh, it's not necessary. For example, the sum of the synchrotron, the fifty and the point sources, uh, but it's normally more complicated uh, depending on the simulation, and it has to be estimated and guessed. So there is a huge uh, uh, need for simulation uh, uh, effort in, in this direction that I'm going to discuss later. So uh, imagine uh, we have this, uh, uh, we have this um, cube, we run a, a PCA uh, on, on the cube, we construct uh, a, a covariance matrix, uh, a frequency frequency covariance matrix, and we extract, for example, three, we decide uh, for three sources. How do we do that? We compute of this covariance uh, matrix from uh, um, the, the again value and the again vector. Uh, we plot the value of the again value and we see that around uh, the third again value uh, it seems to have lost a bit of power. Uh, then uh, we, we construct our sources from this uh, uh, again vector from the matrix and these are the first three that we see. So you see that the first one really looks like the main component in our simulation that is uh, uh, galactic synchrotron emission and then uh, the, the other two seems a strange combination of uh, uh, what is uh, also inside the simulation. So to give you a better uh, vision of, uh, of this, uh, I now uh, show you what are 
actually the component that we put in. So the first one uh, is the pure uh, synchrotron emission that you have put in the simulation. The second one is the free free. And the third one is the point sources. You see, we have uh, added a very strong point sources that you can recognize uh, uh, that is now a bit kind of mixed in the second and in, the, in uh, uh, S map equal one, S map equal two uh, in the one that we extract through this uh, uh, PCA uh, decomposition. So now uh, we have said, okay, let's uh, assume that the, f the, the, the first uh, three uh, and foreground are enough. So what we do is uh, to take the original uh, uh, noise uh, plus foreground plus um, uh, foreground uh, data cube and we subtract to that uh, the the one that is uh, constructed from only the first three uh, and foreground and we assume that uh, with that uh, we are uh, subtracting all the main components uh, that are in our opinion foregrounds because uh, of the fact that the foregrounds are the strongest uh, uh, and the most correlated and so we take out uh, that from our simulation and we get uh, these uh, uh, plot on the bottom uh, and that you see it's uh, uh, very very similar to the one on the top that is the original 21 centimeter signal plus noise only component that has been inserted in the simulation. So this uh, approach works, it was working in CMB before and is working for the 21 centimeter signal. Uh, this is working very well for simulation uh, and uh, uh, the rest of the talk I'm going to discuss how it's a bit more complicated with real data and how we are trying to make simulation more complicated so that they really look much more like the data. Uh, indeed, what happens if we look at data? Uh, if we look at data, for example, this is uh, uh, GBT data uh, analyzed in this paper by Lara Waltz. Um, so what you see here is uh, uh, the fact that when we are trying uh, to clean real data, uh, the numbers that we that we need to, to try to, to, to see something is not three as in the simulation up to now, but these uh, uh, independent component as is, these are called in uh, Laura's analysis, but it's the same as in foreground that goes up to 36. Uh, and still, uh, after 36, these green lines here, uh, we, we, uh, the problem is that the, the power spectrum that we get, is still much higher than the expected 21 centimeter power spectrum. Uh, so what uh, we are measuring actually is still, even after 36 components are taken out from the data, these uh, residual uh, foreground systematics in the data that are there. So the difference here between the uh, upper point and the one with the shaded line is the fact that uh, it's already very good uh, for GBT data if instead of looking as uh, one patch in the sky, uh, the cross-correlated uh, data taken into different moments for example um, and uh, so th this means that you can already kill some of the systematics uh, and, and doing this cross correlation between uh, different for example uh, maps taken in different time and uh, this is very good uh, news for for us for the SKA for Mirkat in general because we have 64 dishes with Mirkat and we're gonna have much more with the SKA mid so we can uh, group uh, the um, the, the, the telescopes in, in, uh, in, uh, in various bunches and cross-correlating the different map that we can obtain with these different groups, we can already kill the bit the systematics, as you see in this plot here. So uh, this is uh, not super reassuring from a 21 centimeter point of view. There's still a lot of systematics in the data, uh, but uh, uh, how do, why we are still working on that, why we are still super excited about this? Because the signal is there, even if there are still a bit of uh, foreground that we need, uh, this is a residual foreground systematic that we need to understand. And indeed, if we cross correlate uh, our um, uh, our data, in, in this case, uh, the GPT data uh, that Laura did cross correlate with, uh, for example, Wiggle Z uh, Lasker Structure Surveys, uh, we, we did indeed in get uh, a very nice detection of the signal. And so this is for GPT, I want to show you what we actually did uh, for in our case, uh, but just before, um, I would like just to restate what is the, the, the idea here. The idea is that we are cross-correlating two different types of survey that have two different types of, uh, uh, of systematics. So in their cross-correlation, these systematics are completely different, are uncorrelated, and they are killed in this cross-correlation. So cross-correlation really help in killing the systematics and enhancing the constraining power of the two probes. So if we do that for our case of um, intensity mapping with Mirkat, uh, we, uh, we need to take 
uh, data fest. Uh, so the way we, uh, we do this is uh, with this uh, uh, strategy of uh, uh, first tracking a point sources for calibration uh, and then scanning the sky uh, at constant elevation uh, and then tracking another point source, specific point sources again. So uh, we, we don't necessarily really uh, calibrate directly with the value of the point sources, but we calibrate what is called the noise diode and then uh, this calibrates our map. So the way uh, the, the, the resulting map is in the sky is uh, depicted in this figure here. So you're going to see in the maps that I'm going to show you uh, in a second these strange fringes here and there. So they come really from this type of, uh, um, uh, of scanning strategy that we are using. So the, um, the way we are taking data is again, as I was discussing before, with these single dishes. So we are using the 64 Mirka dishes as a collection. And uh, here in particular, we are around the redshift. Uh, 0.4 uh, and uh, we are targeting uh, on purpose a similar patch in the sky of VGLZ uh, 11, uh, 11 hours because we want to do cross correlation because we know that at the moment the quality of our data is not enough to do uh, a detection of 21 centimeter signal alone. Uh, so this is how our observation looks like. You can recognize uh, uh, with the help of these uh, magenta dots also point sources, but the smooth background is uh, this uh, uh, synchrotron emission that we have discussed up to now. So the fact that there is a synchrotron emission in the sky. Um, so the, the, the data have been successfully calibrated. This is a very nice result. It's the first time that this type of data are taken uh, for, from Mirkat. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, we have further analyzed this data. So what we have to do, of course, is to clean them, as we have discussed uh, just now, for example, with BCA. So if we do that, uh, it seems uh, we have various techniques to decide how many uh, components we should uh, we should clean. And uh, so in this uh, uh, work uh, for the Mirkart collaboration led by Steve Cunnington, uh, we have used N4 grand equal 30 and uh, the PCA technique that I have described. And uh, this is the, the resulting map that you get. Uh, when you clean uh, away these uh, first 30 modes uh, that you assume is like systematic and foreground. Um, and as before, this is not a detection of the signal, this is still not the signal. But if we do cross correlate this with uh, the Wiggle Z survey, what we get is this uh, very nice detection of the cross correlation power spectrum between uh, the galaxy, the Wiggle Z galaxies, and our cleaned map. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a very nice 7.7 detection of this cross correlation. So the signal is there, we are uh, going in the right direction and uh, uh, this is all very exciting. So what do we need uh, to go uh, to go further uh, to prepare for the SKA observatory? So um, there are, uh, the situation is this, we have 21 centimeter intensity mapping data, uh, that uh, as I was discussing are still very difficult to clean. We, uh, we, we need to, to push this N foreground really high. We don't understand very well what we are actually taking out of the data, but we have the signal in cross correlation. Um, the other side is that uh, simulation are still not a very realistic representation of the data. And this is in a very simple example I was showing, we need the three and foreground to clean the simulation. So of course we can do better than that. Uh, but uh, the problem is also that uh, uh, these cleaning methods that we want to use, that we borrow from CMB, have not still uh, tested, still extensively tested on really difficult simulations. So this is what we are trying to do to improve the simulation and then to improve the um, the. Um, the, the quality of the cleaning of these uh, improving the methods. So we would like, of course, to do that. So it's better and more data. This we, uh, we have a lot of proposal that we have submitted to Mirkat, uh, to the Mirkat telescope to get more data before the SKA is online. But of course, more realistic simulation and more sophisticated uh, cleaning methods. So the final aims is to get this uh, out of power spectrum detection. So not the cross correlation, but the, really only the 21 centimeter line. Uh, uh, power spectrum and validated with simulation so that we are sure of what we have we are measuring and so we can do cosmology with that. So uh, that's why we need uh, simulations and so I'm gonna in the last 10 minutes discuss 
uh, what is the, the, the ingredients that we are using for the simulation. Uh, of course, uh, the 21 centimeter signal, how we simulate that, but also the, the foregrounds, how we simulate this, and the fact that we need all this part of uh, the, the specific simulation regarding, uh, the, for example, also the, the, the effect of the atmosphere and the ground contamination that I'm not going to discuss, uh, but also uh, the radio frequency interference and all the instrumental effect that we need to take into account. So, uh, very briefly, how we are doing for the simulation of the signal. So, when we want to test, um, especially the, the globally the cleaning methods, we don't need super accurate simulation. Of course, you can do simulation in a lot of ways. You can use hydrodynamical simulation. You can use machine learning. There's a lot of techniques that are around. But today, I'm just going to discuss uh, what... Uh, uh, what we have done uh, for our uh, for our analysis. So of course uh, we need uh, uh, H1 is very difficult to simulate because it's a key key ingredient in galaxy evolution. So most of the simulation has it in post process. Uh, I mean it's a it's a tricky business to really get H1 right in the simulation. Uh, so for example, one thing that uh, that we have done is we have taken a semi analytical model, uh, in particular Gaia. Uh, that is a similar model developed by the Observatory of Trieste by Gabriele De Lucia and collaborators. Um, and uh, uh, the, the idea of the simulatical model is that you take an embodied simulation, you construct these uh, merger trees, and you uh, attach uh, properties uh, to, to, to these merger trees while they evolve. So uh, in principle, you have uh, both uh, prescription for, for, the, for uh, H1, H2, uh, and uh, a lot of other prescription for star formation and AGN feedback and uh, supernova feedback. And you, you, you use this prescription while your merger trees and so in the way the end body simulation is evolving. So from that, we can, for example, extract uh, the uh, total H1 uh, mass as a function of halo mass and use these to do um, as a HOD, in HOD technique, in halo occupation distribution technique. Indeed, what we have done, uh, we have taken this relation of how the H1 relates to halos and then we can have taken a cosmological uh, simulation uh, based on a fast methods, for example, LPT, and we have paint uh, H1 on that. And so from that, we have extracted these 21 centimeter maps that we use for our simulation. Uh, what about the foregrounds? So the foregrounds, we need uh, uh, prescription that are taken, for example, of the study from the CMB. Um, of course, we would like to have uh, foregrounds estimation uh, more close to the frequency that we actually use. Uh, but uh, uh, for example, the Plasca model uh, is a very good source uh, of how we model this, uh, this, uh, this foreground. Uh, so for the synchrotron, uh, we still use the Aslan map, uh, and in particular some reanalysis of that. Um, the, the, the other, uh, the point source in the free free are mostly taken from, uh, from the Planck sky model and other, and other uh, uh, simulations. Uh, what are the instrumental effects that we need to take into account? Well, first of all, the fact that uh, there is a response from these dishes, uh, the beam, uh, and uh, so the, the, we have considered a Gaussian beam uh, in some of the simulation, but in principle, there are measurements of this uh, response of the SK beam that you have this, uh, you find these, uh, these side lobes in the beam response. And these side lobes are very important and needs to take into account. Uh, but also we need to take into account the scanning strategy. We need to take into account the fact that there is RFI. Uh, so, uh, just uh, a few words on the beam, I don't want to get uh, too technical, but uh, uh, to give you an idea of how much uh, is necessary to really be uh, realistic when we do this type of simulation. So, as we were saying, the Mirkat beam and in the future also the SK mid uh, um, dish is, is going to have the same problem as, the, as Mirkat. So, this beam has side lobes. So these are what you're seeing here with these bumps that are appearing. And these bumps kind of confuse the way we are uh, looking at the sky, but also the way uh, we, we can we try to subtract uh, the foreground, especially imagine if you have a point source that is a bit off with respect to where you're pointing. And also the fact that these, uh, the other problem is that this uh, uh, structure of side lobes changes a function of frequency. So there is an evolution with frequency. So we have done some tests on that in, uh, in a various moments with various pro projects. Uh, here here, just, just let me report this plot uh, from uh, this paper uh, with uh, um, a, a student of uh, UWC that uh, recent, recently graduated, Siabonga uh, Mashahule. And uh, so if we take into account 
all uh, the evolution of frequency of these side lobes, what we see in simulation is that instead of recovering uh, the, the H1 power spectrum as we expect, this is a particular way of measuring the power spectrum, just uh, the line of sight power spectrum, what you see is that uh, the presence of, uh, of this uh, strange beam plus and the, 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 the structure of the foreground complicates the cleaning and we get these bumps uh, or over subtraction and this is very uh, worrisome somehow so we have developed technique to try to take this into account. Uh, we did even this uh, in a mar much more detailed uh, uh, through this uh, foreground subtraction challenge that we have started a few years ago. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we are still working on, on, uh, on improvement on this, but basically what we have done uh, as a uh, subset of the SK intensity mapping focus group, uh, we have created the, the, uh, the, the best simulation we could. Uh, that would represent uh, ideally uh, how the data looks like with uh, a lot of systematics in and uh, the, the question was so uh, how would your favorite uh, uh, extraction of foreground method would uh, work how would you how much would you recover the actual cosmological signal that we have controlling so we did this kind of a challenge in a blind way people didn't know uh, what was the, the level of the 21 centimeter signal inside this uh, uh, complex simulation that we have created so we added various foreground model this h1 realistic map done uh, starting from prescription from the semi analytical model and then instrumental effects both for mirkat and the ska and then tested a lot of blind uh, subtraction methods and see how they were uh, uh, behaving so uh, this is uh, just some highlights of the result of the first challenge we are uh, working for uh, constructing new more accurate simulation um, in the meantime also learning a lot from the data but so this was uh, the result of last year uh, and the question were how much uh, the instrumented foreground coupling is actually impacting our signal reconstruction um, and one thing that we try to do is to uh, define statistics to actually check what was this uh, level of cleaning and so for example here uh, the cleaning quality uh, in this plot the central plot uh, it's uh, uh, just the difference between uh, the angular power spectrum at different frequencies with respect to the true one that we have in input uh, if everything was going fine it should be all white but you see there are residual structure and this structure really uh, uh, are understandable in a way of the foreground and this uh, beam effect and other systematic effect enters uh, the game. Um, we did then try to compare uh, the various uh, methods and in particular here you see these spider plots the larger the plots the better the method is behaving and of course since it was a blind subtraction people didn't really know what was the level of the foreground that uh, the number of foregrounds and the component they want to sub subtract so this was also uh, something that uh, the, the participants in the in the challenge had to decide so uh, the larger the spider plot the better it is but what you can see here is that different methods kind of behave uh, better in some of the statistics that we defined uh, depending on the method so of course one of the uh, of the conclusion of this is that the more methods you have the more you can compare the more you can learn so how do we want to move forward uh, well uh, the from my data point of view uh, we have this uh, uh, Mirkat Mirklas, uh, it's called the the, uh, the, the survey uh, data that we are uh, uh, analyzing. That we have a 7.7 .7 sigma detection uh, on, uh, that uh, in cross correlation. And so what we are doing is uh, uh, to improve uh, uh, the, our understanding of the instrument. So in, to improve the, the analysis pipeline. So we have new L band data that we are analyzing, much more data than before. We have uh, UHF band. Uh, data available this means that we can go to higher frequencies uh, sorry to higher redshift so to lower frequencies um, at the same time what we are trying to do is to improve uh, and, and refine our end-to-end -end simulation so that to, to really merge towards what we are seeing in the data and again what the final aim is to measure this 21 centimeter auto power spectrum uh, and uh, not only measure this but also to validate this with realistic simulation so this uh, leads me to my conclusion I hope I convince you uh, that even if uh, a 21 centimeter cosmology still have to prove its uh, full potential, there is an incredible window into the evolution of the universe. Intensity mapping surveys are taking data, uh, for example, MIRCLAS, 
uh, but there will be the SK coming soon. There are other experiments that I didn't discuss uh, that are taking uh, a lot of data. Uh, we have detection in cross-correlation, uh, that is uh, a very good uh, uh, detection. Uh, and uh, what we are doing is analyzing the new data. We are making an effort in understanding uh, more the instrument and uh, develop better analysis pipeline. And of course, we try to keep improving the simulation, not only the signal, but the foreground and all these instruments are effect. And the idea is really to prepare for this SK era that is going to start soon because SK is going to uh, be uh, ready in the uh, next couple of years. Uh, and uh, so uh, we want to see what is the potential contribution that this type of survey uh, can have on the knowledge of the ASCII structure. So hopefully have an idea, uh, a better idea of the dark universe also through uh, 21 centimeter intensity mapping. Uh, with this I finish. Thanks a lot for your attention and thanks again uh, to the organizer uh, for uh, letting me speak at the Cosmology from Home. <laughs>